Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ralphie Dude, and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the Radar Warning Receiver, or RWR for short. Now, to all the new people who don't know any better, the RWR is this device in a cockpit that makes you think you're having a stroke in your ears. The reality, though, is that the RWR is your lifeline against ground and airborne threats. And although the sound is less than pleasing, it truly is only trying to look out for your best interest. Hey! Listen! In layman's terms, the radar warning receiver works with a bunch of sensors around your aircraft. The entire job and purpose of these sensors is to essentially soak up all of that radiation, or radar, and basically show you in a bird's eye view exactly where that is in relation to your aircraft. Now, the radar warning receiver, as you can see here, and this is from the DCS A10C2 manual at uh, this page right here, 419, this is a bird's eye view of what you're going to see. The center is obviously you, and anything in front of you, that's 12 o'clock position, that's in front, 6 o'clock position will be behind you, and so on and so forth. When the contacts are closer to the center, they are not technically physically closer to you, it's just that their relative threat range has increased. Now, I'm not using the phrase relative threat range just to confuse you. It is something that I'm going to explain in detail in a second. Uh, but just understand that as things move closer, they are a bigger threat to you, but they are not technically physically closer to you. And that distinction needs to be made uh, for sure uh, in order for you to fully understand how the radar warning receiver works. And now it's very simple and we'll go over everything, so don't worry. But first, let's kind of figure out what's going on with radars. Okay, so assuming that this is you and we're looking at this from the side and this is an enemy aircraft, if the enemy aircraft has his radar turned on and he's scanning up high up here, uh, he doesn't see you and you have no idea that he's there, unless one of you can visually see each other. Okay, that makes sense, right? Now, what about if the enemy moves his radar sweep down here, and now his radar energy is hitting you? Well, at this instance, the radar warning receiver sensor detects this radar energy wave hitting it right here, and it will then show up on the radar warning receiver and let you know that there's an enemy aircraft that sees you. So, what can we infer from this? If they see you, you know about it. Great! Let's talk about the different sounds. So, because the enemy radar can work in many different ways, and I'm not going to cover everything, I'm just going to cover some of the most common things that you're going to see, uh, we need to really fully understand what we're seeing on the radar warning receiver, and more so, what we are hearing. Those noises aren't there just to annoy you. They mean something, and you need to start getting used to what that means. If the enemy radar is just sweeping the sky, and you just happen to be caught in his wave of radar, well, he's scanning and he sees you. But, you know, if you have other friendlies that are in the area, and, you know, they're flying around, and, you know, there's guys over here or something like that, you know, he's picking up all of those different contacts. This is typically a RWS, or Range While Scan Track. Basically, all he's doing is just scanning out into a distance. He's looking around and he's picking up all sorts of little dots on his radar. Okay, great. Now, is this an actual threat to you yet? Maybe, maybe not. In the RWS, if the guy then decides, okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and actually select you. So he's targeting you specifically. So from RWS, when you do that, you actually switch to something called... STT, or Single Target Track. The entire purpose of this is to no longer start scanning everything else because he doesn't care about that. He has singled you out and he is focusing everything that he has on you. So the radar beam energy now tightens and he's only scanning that particular section of the sky. That way he has the most up-to-date information and he doesn't have to waste all of that radar energy scanning everything else. He only cares about you. Now, when that happens, that is going to sound like this. <laughs> I'm in danger! So, just to recap, when things are just hitting your aircraft, just generally scanning, it sounds like this. And if someone has actually singled you out and they are focusing their radar beam energy on you, it's going to sound like this. 
Now, one thing that you should know is that if you hear that locked on tone, there is a small little chance that perhaps he has actually locked up somebody and you're within that beam's range. So for instance, let's say that this is just another one of your friendlies and you just happen to be right here. Well, you're gonna get that beam energy hitting your aircraft and your RWR is gonna detect it and it's gonna go off. Assume that he's targeting you, but once in a blue moon, you're gonna have this situation where you're just going through someone's radar beam energy like that and you're just picking up those signals. Now, uh, one of the most common things that you're gonna see this happen is let's say you're playing at Georgia at war and you've just taken off from Anapa and you're flying out towards the enemy and your Patriot missile sites behind you seem like they have locked you up. They haven't. The reality is that you're just in the way of them trying to lock another target and it looks a little something like this. So let's say that this is a friendly Patriot missile site right here. This is you and this is an enemy. All that's really happening is that the Patriot missile site is doing this and you just happen to be in its way. And the Patriot missile site and the Hawk sites and whatnot, they all have really wide beam ranges. So so it's just a little tidbit to know, to know and understand. But if the enemy aircraft has locked you up and you have that STT lock sound and indication on the radio warning receiver, um, you know, assume that he has targeted you and do something about it, you know? However, there is something called TWS, which is track while scan. And the aircraft that utilize this uh, do it to some very good extent. It's a good idea to understand how, let's say the AIM-120 works. So under normal circumstances, if the enemy aircraft, which is gonna be this guy, uh, wants to fire at you, he's gonna go from RWS, so range while scan, down to STT, and he's gonna focus all of his radar energy at you. Cool. So you have that annoying beeping sound going off, and now he decides to actually fire a missile at you. So let's say he fires an AIM-7. Okay, at that stage, when he fires that missile, there's gonna be a little bit of a change in radar signature that your radar warning receiver is actually gonna be able to pick up. And when that happens, the radar warning receiver is gonna be able to detect that there's been a missile launch. And this is the symbology you're gonna see with the flashing circle indicating that, hey, this aircraft is using its radar to guide a missile to hit you. So what you can infer from here is that this is the launching platform and it is the one that is actively shooting at you. Now in TWS, things are a little bit different. So in TWS, the aircraft is actually still scanning a fair bit of section of the skies and he's able to basically detect all the aircraft in the same exact manner that he was in RWS. Uh, in essence, what he's able to do is soft lock, so to speak. Basically, he's tagging things and telling the uh, radar to basically, you know, keep an eye on these guys. You know, this is my area of focus. So what this aircraft could do is tag this guy, this guy, and this guy. And if it's something like an F-15, for instance, he can fire up to four targets simultaneously. So let's assume that this is an enemy F-15, just for this demonstration purpose. What he can do is in TWS, he's gonna go ahead and tag all three of these targets and then he's gonna launch a missile. Now here is the difference between TWS and RWS. There has never been a switch to SCT or single target track. He hasn't focused his radar beam energy on any of these targets. Instead, what he's doing is utilizing a data link between the launching platform, which is this F-15 and the missile. So the missile goes out and it's fired and it uses that data link information to link between the F-15's radar and the AIM-120. And the radar from the F-15 is basically sending periodic updates as the radar is getting hits back from, uh, or the returns back from hitting the aircraft, right? And it is basically guiding the missile over towards its target. And it's gonna adjust its course over time as you maneuver or, you know, whatever happens, right? Let's just assume there's three missiles there flying out at three different targets. And then at some point, the missile will then stop receiving the data. It basically says, okay, I'm close enough to the target. I'm going to sever this link between the missile and the F-15 or the launching platform. And this is the moment that we call pit bull. And the missile will then activate its own radar and hopefully lock the right target. 
So at this point, let's say this is you in the middle, the radar is activated from the missile, and it is at this stage for most aircraft that have a radar warning receiver, where they're going to actually get a radar warning receiver missile launch. So the entire time that this missile was traveling from here to here, the missile has not given any indication that it is going at the enemy aircraft. There has been no change from the F-15's radar, so the enemy aircraft has no idea that the missile has been flying this entire time. Now, these aircraft obviously have the F-15 on their radar warning receiver, and they obviously see that, you know, he's there, but up to this point, they haven't known that the missile was already traveling towards them until Pitbull happened and the missile actually activated its radar, and it is when the radar warning receiver finally attacks that their missile's radar is hitting your aircraft, that's when the warning happens. So this really sucks for all these planes. However, because you're an A-10, you actually have a little bit of an advantage. And this is in form of something called the MWS, or Missile Warning System. Now, the Missile Warning System works in a sense uh, similar to the regular sensors for the RWR, but it is basically kind of, uh, think of it like a bunch of dudes strapped around your aircraft with thermal cameras. And their entire job is to basically look for rocket plumes or smoke plumes and things of that nature. Well, as soon as they see what they perceive to be a missile rocket plume or something to that extent, they're gonna warn you, hey, there's a missile coming. And it is because of this that the MWS system can save your life over here, but we won't save these guys here and here because they don't have the MWS. So they are only going to pick up the missile launch as soon as the missile's radar has gone active and it is targeting them. You, however, have the MWS system, which will warn you of that launch as soon as the missile leaves the rail of the F-15. So your warning is going to be from here assuming that the MWS system actually picks up the launch. If the aircraft is 40 nautical miles and 50,000 feet above you, there's a pretty decent chance that uh, the MWS system is not going to see that. So it, it depends how far away and depends if the MWS even sees it. But it's a fantastic system. And because of this, you also are able to pick up IR launches. So up to this point, we've been talking about radar guided missiles. But an IR launch or infrared launch, uh, let's just assume it's a Strela, an SA-13. Well, this thing is extremely annoying because it's basically a heat-seeking missile. It doesn't output any energy. Thus, how is your radar warning receiver supposed to detect anything if the missile is not outputting anything, right? This is why the RWR will never go off for a IR missile. However, it is the MWS that is saving your butt. So as soon as that IR missile gets launched, it detects that smoke plume coming from the rocket. And it is that detection right here that is going to go off and you're going to see a missile on your radar warning receiver. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. Now, the thing that you need to understand and say, okay, well, how do I know if it's a radar guided missile? How do I know if it's an IR guided missile? Well, this is where looking at the radar warning receiver is going to give you all the information. If it's a radar guided missile, then as soon as that missile gets fired, let's say it's an STT or single target track, and you get the detection as soon as the missile is fired off the rail, well, you know, you on the radar warning receiver are going to see the launching platform. Like in this instance, you know, here is an F-15 and it's launching at you. Well, you know it. The thing is blinking. It's telling you, hey, that's what launched a missile at you. Heidi ho, there we go. Now, as far as an IR launch, well, we don't know what launched at you. It's an IR missile. The only thing that the radar warning receiver is showing you is that, hey, that the MWS system saw the missile and there was a missile coming. I don't know who fired at you. It's, it's just a missile. Just do something, right? So on the RWR, in that instance, what you're going to see is an M. So it's a circle with an M telling you, hey, it's a missile. But we have no information about any launching platform. 
There's nothing guiding it. So at this point, you can assume that it's an IR launch and you should probably start dodging with flares. Now, it is worth mentioning that there is something very interesting happening here. So the RWR is detecting that the F-15 has just launched a missile at you. In this case, it's an AIM-7 radar guided missile. But the MWS has also picked up the launch, which is why the M is showing up. And as you can see on the right, the MWS is also saying launch because it detected it. So the MWS system is actually working in conjunction with the RWR and both of the information is being displayed on the RWR here. I guess this is a good point to start saying, if it's a radar guided launch, you're gonna dump chaff. If it's an IR guided launch, you're gonna dump flares. Okay, so I promised you that we're gonna talk about the relative threat range. Okay, so let's take a look at this example right here. We have the RWR and the SA-10 site, which is a long range SAM, is really close to us in the center. And you have the SA-6 site, which is a medium to short range uh, SAM system, and it's further away at our 12 o'clock position. And now if I pose the question, which one of these two things is closer to you physically, what would you say? Most of you would probably answer, yeah, the SA-10 site. Obviously, it's closer to the center. It's got to be the one that's closest to me right now. Good guess, but actually no. Okay, so let's try and make sense of why that may or actually may not be the case right now. So what could be happening is that we have the SA-10 site, and then we have the SA-6 site, which is, mm, I don't know, let's say over here. And obviously we're looking at this from a top-down picture. So the SA-6 site is actually physically closer to you. And the SA-10 site is physically much, much further away from you. So how come the SA-10 site is being shown as closer to you on the array warning receiver? The reason is that the SA-6's range, let's say, is over here. Meanwhile, the SA-10's range extends way, 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 way out there. I think you should start seeing what the issue is. The problem is that we are already within firing range of the SA-10 site. Meanwhile, although we are approaching the SA-6 and the SA-6 is closer to us, we are still outside of its firing range because this is its firing range right here. Meanwhile, the SA-10s is way out here. So more than likely, the SA-10 is probably already going to start shooting at us right about now. Hence why the radar warning receiver is saying that the SA-10 is a relatively closer threat range than the SA-6. Now, it can be very difficult in the very beginning to actually try and understand this, but as you take a look at the radar warning receiver, the picture you're seeing there is going to shift. It's going to move because you're in a very dynamic world. If the SA-10 site was still out here, right, and you are still obviously well within its firing range, and we're starting to move forward towards the SA-6 site, and now we're, let's say, over here, and the SA-6 site is here, and we are now within the fire range of the SA-6, well, the relative threat range is pretty much identical in that we're both within the fire range of the SA-6 and we are within firing range of the SA-10. So on the radar warning receiver, it would look something like this. As you can see, both the SA-10 and SA-6 are very much near the center. Are we equidistant from both the SAMs? No, but relative threat range wise, you know, we're both within firing range on both these things. Technically speaking, the SA-6 would probably be a little bit closer to the center because if the SA-6 would fire at us right now, it would probably reach us faster versus the SA-10, which will still take some time to get to us. So even though we're within firing range, the SA-6 is probably should be closer to the center because it is a much bigger threat to us when we're in this position right here. So if you're having trouble trying to understand what you're seeing on a radar warning receiver and trying to interpret the physical ranges of things, well, this is where flying forward and observing what's happening on your radar warning receiver as you transition through a hostile place will kind of tell you what you need to know if you're really paying attention. All right, let's talk about a concept called notching or beaming. Uh, they're exactly the same thing. The only difference is who's doing it. So if someone's doing it to you, then they are notching. And if you're doing it to them, you are beaming. Or is it the other way around? Anyway, it doesn't matter. In any case, this is a purely defensive maneuver that could save your life. So it is pretty important to understand what's happening because a lot of people, especially if they're new, they don't really understand what the concept of what's happening here on their radar. Now you're on A-10, you don't have a radar, but you can use this concept against them in a purely defensive maneuver. 
All right, so we're looking at this picture from a side perspective. So, you know, we got little buildings over here. We have some happy little trees. Look at that. Isn't that a nice little tree? If it's scanning the radar out directly in front of it or maybe even above it, um, there's not much trouble without really getting to the concepts of PRFs or pulse repeat frequencies. Uh, generally speaking, anything that's in front or above, it shouldn't be too much of a problem for the F-15 to pick up on the radar. Now, a problem occurs if the F-15 has to look down below its altitude. And the reason is that now we're introducing some backscatter information, such as these buildings, such as the mountain, such as this tree. All of these things are radar energy bouncing back towards the F-15, and the F-15 is picking these things up. So we needed to figure out a concept, a strategy, some sort of way of rejecting these things, because we're concerned with air targets, not ground targets. So even though we are getting physically closer by going towards these things like the trees, the buildings and whatnot, the buildings and the trees and the mountains, they're actually not moving in reference to the ground. If we take a look at this building, for instance, you know, it's not moving. Sure, I'm getting physically closer to the building, but is it going left or is it going right? No, it's a stationary thing. As far as the building is concerned with the reference to the ground itself, it's not moving. Aha. Okay, so now we've developed a very quick and dirty way of saying, all right, if something's not moving with the reference to the ground, let's just reject that information as backscatter information. So a very interesting concept that's going to occur. If let's say I'm flying along with my A little A10 and I'm flying towards the F-15 and he's looking down, you know, that backscatter information of the buildings, trees and whatnot, that's happening in the background. But my aircraft is going to show up on his radar without too much of a problem because I am getting closer to him and I am moving in reference to the ground. And of course, if I'm flying away, this is also the same exact concept, except, you know, the F-15 is probably going to be faster than me. So his closure rates are going to be positive. But again, I'm moving with reference to the ground. So he doesn't have as much of a problem in fighting me. But what happens if I turn perpendicular to this F-15 and now I'm going to fly out of the page or into the page as we're looking at it. So we are now going to be perfectly perpendicular to the F-15. Again, physically, he's obviously getting closer to us, but as far as this picture, as we're looking at it right now, with reference to the ground, we have actually stopped moving. We are no longer going left or right as we're looking at it right now. Thus, the F-15's radar is actually going to drop us as backscatter information, because as far as the F-15's radar is concerned, it's using the same exact rejection algorithm as the building, the trees, and the mountains. So, as you can see here, this target is going towards the F-15 on the radar, and then it's going to make a sharp turn perpendicular to it, and this is the moment where the F-15's radar drops it from the image as backscatter information. You're suddenly gone. And of course, remember, you have to be below this aircraft's altitude, otherwise this is not going to work. Now, in the case of something like an F-15, as with many other aircraft, it does have a memory bank. So let's take a look at this from a top-down, bird's-eye view picture of exactly what's happening. If I'm flying along like so, then he obviously sees me. Let's just assume that his radar is scanning, it's pretty wide up here, so, you know, he's picking me up. I go, oh shit. You know, that's an enemy aircraft. I know because there's enemy F-15s on the opposite team. I got to do something. You know, nearest friendlies are really far away. So I'm going to need to deal with this myself. Now I'm going to make sure that I'm obviously below him in altitude. And now I'm going to go and traverse so that I am perpendicular to this aircraft. So in this instance, if I can keep the F-15 signature on the RWR to my 3 o'clock or 9 o'clock, in this instance, it's my 3 o'clock position, and perfectly there, or as perfectly as humanly possible, it should drop me from the radar. Now, there is a small little caveat for something like the F-15, because it has a little memory bank of like 3 to 4 seconds. So what's going to happen is that it recognizes, hey, there was a target, but now it's moved into the notch, therefore we should drop it. However, if there is a missile that's outbound, let's say when you are still in this position, he fired an AIM-120 at you and it's coming at you, and you went into the notch and you dropped from the radar, the radar is going to go into this memory bank and it's going to say, okay, well, we knew he was right here, the last place that we saw him. And as it kept moving, you know, we can assume that he should be somewhere around here, right? So the missile is going to course correct for that position. And if you, for some reason, 
let's say, make a turnaround. Let's say you did a 180 instead of just going perfectly perpendicular. And now you're heading back away from him this way. So now you're heading away from him. And let's say you've done that within the four to five seconds when he lost you when you were in the notch over here. Well, he's going to reacquire you on that radar and it's going to continue to guide the missile towards you once you are back out of the notch. So the concept here is that you have to get into the notch and you have to stay in the notch. And this is a very scary concept because you still have him on your radar warning receiver. His radar waves are still going outbound and hitting the right side of your wing. Even though you are pretty darn sure that you have dropped from his radar, you know, you're still picking up those signals. So if he was in STT or single target track where you hear this tone and you went into the notch, within a few seconds, that tone should change back to the general search radar of him being an RWS or in TWS. You're still gonna pick up the signal, but you should no longer be within his STT or single target track. But it takes a few seconds for this to happen and it can be very nerve wracking. Now, in order to stay in this notch, the concept that you have to be aware of is keep him on that three o'clock position to the best of your abilities. But you cannot be flying in a straight line because as you see, if you end up over here, are you perfectly perpendicular to this target now? Nope. So what you would have to do is you'd have to fly basically in an arc around the F-15 in order to maintain yourself within that three o'clock or nine o'clock position. You know, hopefully if he gets close enough where you can visually acquire him, you know, switch to your aim nines and you try and dogfight the F-15. I've done it plenty of times. I'm sure some of you are going to be able to do this as well. You know, it happens. Or maybe he's going to forget about you, say, screw it, I see another target, and then he's just going to go for that and leave you alone. You never know. But just remember that this is a purely defensive maneuver, but it can save your life if you utilize this correctly. All right, so let's show all these concepts in action. I have an enemy F-15 in front of me, and he has me locked in the STT. He has just fired an AIM-7 radar guided missile at me. My roaring warning receiver has picked up the launch. There it is. Wonderful. So now I'm going to go defensive and I'm going to put the aircraft to my three o'clock position. Now, as I do so, I'm going to actually drop the lock right here, but not because I'm in the notch just yet, but because my right wing has been tilted to the right so far up that I'm no longer picking up any of the signals. But as I roll back right, I pick them back up again. And you'll notice that I am now effectively in the notch and his STT lock has been broken because that lock has been broken, the M7 has gone stupid. So now I'm going to try and do the same exact thing, but to my 9 o'clock position. As I roll back towards the F-15, I am out of the notch. The F-15 has locked me up and has acquired me over here. And as I move the F-15 over to my 9 o'clock, you'll see that I have dumped his STT lock because I'm effectively back in the notch. And here we're going to see a common mistake. Because we've been flying in a straight line and we have been flying in an arc around the F-15, instead of him being on my perfect 9 o'clock position, he actually dropped over to my 8 o'clock position and I effectively got out of the notch. He saw me and now he has acquired me and he fired an AIM-7 again. So I very quickly moved to the left, put him back in the 9 o'clock position and the AIM-7 has been dumped. He's so close that I can see him and now I have a fighting chance in defending myself with the AIM-9s. If you would like to understand what the symbols mean, then you can also go to the manual, go for page 420, and you're going to see all of the different symbology that is used for all the different contacts. For the most part, they're relatively uh, straightforward, like a 3 is an SA3, a 6 is an SA6, an SA10, SA13, yada, 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 a 15 is an SA15, or it can be an F15. And this is how we tell the difference. Now there's a cool little website from Hoggett, which is the threat database, and this is the URL for that. And it shows you the F-15's radar warning receiver. Uh, but this receiver is actually very similar, if not almost identical, to the one that you're gonna see in the A-10. So the distinctions that you can see over here is that the airborne threats actually have a little carrot on top. So there, this is the way that you tell if it's an air contact or if it's a SAM. So one of the most misidentified uh, threats on the ready warning receiver is the 15. So if you see a 15 like this, 
well, this is an SA15 Tor, which is a SAM. However, if you see the same exact symbol, but it's got the little carrot on top like this one, then that is an F15. And that's a fairly <laughs> important distinction to make. So this is how we tell between uh, an airborne threat and a ground-based threat. And then you have things like the diamond, which shows you the highest priority threats. You can typically ignore that because it's the radio warning receiver making that distinction. I think you as a pilot should start making that distinction for yourself. What is the biggest threat for me out here on the radio warning receiver? You know, if I'm really high up and the, you know, it's a SAM that, and I'm flying above that SAM's range, is that really the highest priority threat? Maybe not, but that MiG-29 that's bearing down on me, that guy probably is, right? So start thinking about that a little bit more on your own and don't rely too much on these symbols because, you know, after all, it's just a computer and it's for you to, to make that distinction for yourself in this dynamic war zone that you're going to be flying in. Uh, the other thing that you may see is the newest threat, which you're going to see a half circle. Um, this is the newest thing, the last thing that's just popped in on the radar warning receiver. Then, of course, you have your launch warning where you have the full flashing circle uh, that will let you know the launching platform, which in this instance is an SA-6. So, hey, the SA-6 has launched at me and, you know, there's a missile coming at me. Or in this instance, like I told you with the MWS system, you're going to have the M with the circle if, let's say, you don't have a launch platform and your MWS has picked up a missile. Typically, usually means it's an IR missile coming your way. But uh, as you scroll down, you're actually going to see a chart of all of the different uh, types of contacts, what the ranges are, how many missiles they have on board, and things of that. It's, uh, it's a fun little uh, thing to have. You don't have to memorize any of this. Um, what you're going to realize as you keep playing the A-10 is you're going to find out the hard way <laughs> just how much of a threat some of these things actually are and how far away, you know, all that nonsense. For the most part, you're an A-10, you're not going to be flying very fast and you're certainly not going to be flying very high. So I would not rely on flying above a, a SAM threat unless it's something like AAA or something to that um, extent, or maybe the shore rats. It might be a good idea to memorize um, a couple of the shore rats, like the Strellas, 12,000 feet. You know, that's something that I memorized pretty early on, and I've been able to fly above shore rats because 12,000 feet is, you know, you can get there. I typically sometimes will cruise around 15 to 18,000 feet. That's like a fun little zone to be in. And you're going to be able to get above these Strellas and uh, the SA-9s and SA-13s, specifically the SA-13. But anyway, let's stop over here because this video is already way too long. I hope you guys enjoyed the information you were given, and I will see you all on the next one. Cheers. Mm -hmm.